everyone. Just to make a few quick disclaimers and acknowledgements before the video starts. This series and this episode were inspired by Bibloridian's Conlang case study. I highly recommend that you check out his channel and I will leave a link to it in the description. I'm trying to use his format to see my own conlanging process and to present my own conlang to you. Finally, I would like to say that by all means, I am not a professional linguist. You will probably hear me mess up on terminology and explanations more than once or twice. So without further ado, please enjoy the video. Thank you. Hello everyone, I am Wapnik, and today we're going to be doing some conlanging on camera. So, this is going to be my first video, so I'll have a little intro video, but or a channel trailer, but if you didn't know, uh, I'm planning to start posting some uh, educational content, especially focused around linguistics and other various uh, world-building topics. And uh, in the description, I again, I don't expect this channel to be too big, but just in case uh, you want to talk about some assorted world building and educational topics, I have a little Discord that you can uh, join in the description. Anyways, for our conlang, uh, it's very important that we set out our goals. So, goal number one is that we want this to be a naturalistic language. And that means you, we should use the diachronic approach. So this means that uh, unlike other forms of conlangs like engelangs or interlangs or other things like that, we're going to be evolving this conlang from a proto-language. And as you can see down here, I have separate spreadsheets for just overall planning, proto-language, and modern language. Anyways, uh, the last thing I will uh, say before we get on with the rest of the goals and the actual conlanging is that I expect that you have some basic knowledge of linguistics or at least grammar, but to those who don't know uh, some of these more complex topics are, I will try my best to uh, briefly explain them. Now let's start with some goals for this conlang. So I want this to uh, be a nat lang, or at least be somewhat naturalistic. So this means we're going to be evolving a, pro a modern language. So we're going to be evolving a modern language from a proto-language. So I would like, therefore, our uh, grammatical structures to be uh, reasons and uh, an explanation behind uh, why each of them develop. And this also kind of gives us some fun little quirks like irregularity or cultural metaphors and expressions. I also want this uh, conlang to be polysynthetic. And I'm going to try my best to explain what that means. It is somewhat of an umbrella term. But essentially there means there's a high degree of synthesis, or there are a high degree of uh, morphemes per word. And a morpheme is like a little chunk of grammatical information. So, while in English, uh, again, this is just kind of an example, uh, a polysynthetic language could convey in uh, just one word what, uh, what, uh, English, what English could convey in an entire sentence. So examples of polysynthetic languages are like Navajo, Inuktitut, and Ojibwe, and a bunch of others. And usually these languages will not always, but quite often have complex uh, tense aspect mood morphology, and they'll also have other things like classifiers. Oops. Oh dear. Class classifiers and polypersonal agreement, all of that kind of stuff. They will also have. This is an excellent segue to our next thing: affixial verbs and noun incorporation. English does noun incorporation to some degree. It's not too big of a thing. So an example is you. I guess you could say. I picked berries, or you could say I berry picked, where the 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 noun kind of gets sucked onto the verb. Now many languages will take this to the point where there are actual classifiers that evolve on the verb, 
or uh, they'll just use it a lot more frequently, like chukchi. Another example of this, of how it's used, is I, I read a paper on this recently. So I believe in some Eskimo Aleut languages, and I'm pretty sure chukchi, they use these things called affixial verbs. Affixial verbs. Now, affixial verbs are kind of weird. So if I give a sentence like, I reindeer, and then I gave the affixial verb eat. So I'm just going to eat affix. So this affixial verb, that we're, we're just calling, we're just saying eat, so because Chukchi has one like this, it can't stand on its own. It needs to have a noun to be incorporated. It needs to attach to a little noun, but otherwise it still behaves like a verb. And I would like these in this conling. And the thing about these is as these evolve and are, uh, are used more so as affixial verbs over time, uh, the meaning will bleach a little bit. So for an example, the affixial verb that is just named eat and chukchi, it, it can, can also be, be mean animal or whatever was being eaten or the thing that was being un eaten. It can imply that it was actually maybe killed or hunted. So saying I reindeer with our little eat affixial verb can imply something like I hunted down the reindeer and then I ate it or I killed it. So yeah, we want those kind of denomial verb constructions. The next concept is kind of a weird and more complex one, so I will be rambling for quite a while about this. Ergativity and direct inverse alignment. Now, for those of you who don't know, morphosyntactic alignment is the way a language will uh, arrange, not only arrange words or arguments around in a clause, but it will also mark the arguments depending on their role. Again, I'm probably going to misexplain a few things, so I apologize. This is a conlanging video. I am not a professional linguist. <laughs> so, English is what we call a nominative accusative or an accusative language. And there are a bunch of other accusative languages, and most languages are, or maybe most languages that are commonly spoken. So, a lot of the big languages, like most, again, most European languages, uh, Turkish, Japanese, Korean uh, are all nominative accusative. Mandarin Chinese is nominative accusative. And what this means is, let me define a few rules first. So you can have an intransitive sentence and a transitive sentence. So in the transitive sentence, you have one main argument, the subject. Who is doing the action and so for an, or who and who is also experiencing the action. Then in a transitive sentence, we have the agent, the one who's doing the thing, and then the patient, the one who's receiving or being affected by the action. So an example of an intransitive sentence in English is you can say, he sleeps. So we have the subject and the verb. Or you could say a sentence like, uh, he ate it, or let me think of a better one, uh, he loves her, I could say that. And in English we don't have too much of a noun case system, but look what's going on here. We're marking the subject of this intransitive verb the same as the agent of a transitive verb. And to many of you who, again, speak an accusative language or who are uh, not so accustomed to ergativity or don't know about it, you're going to go, duh, yeah. Well, ergative languages, instead of marking the subject and agent, subject and agents are buddies, and then the patient's the weird one, we mark that. You mark, oops, uh, instead you treat the subject of an intransitive verb like the patient of a transitive verb. So, again, I'm not saying that you would necessarily put the subject in the accusative, but I'm just emphasizing that it's different. So you could say something like, in an ergative language, why can't I type? He sleeps, but then him loves she. And again, this isn't exactly how it would work, but I'm trying to emphasize 
that instead of treating, instead of marking P or the patient, ergative languages will mark A, mark the agent in a, what we call an ergative case. Now, that's ergativity, all done and dusted, but what about direct and verse alignment? So direct and verse alignment is found in uh, languages like Ojibwe and many other Algonquin languages. And to some degree, uh, and actually I would say yes, it is kind of found in Navajo. So in, in these languages, there will be a hierarchy of either animacy or, pers or person. So if I take Ojibwe as an example, second person pronouns are the most important, then first. Then third. Why is that being funny? I do not know what I'm doing, as you can tell. Then third. Then third obvious. Which is just a fancy word. Then third inanimate. And then you have like impersonal. Which is kind of a funny thing. So these these uh so on this hierarchy based on salience and importance, the arguments will always have to go in this order. So a sentence, let's just take this hierarchy correct, uh, grammatically, you hit me would be correct, but I hit you would not be grammatically correct. You would have to say, you were hit by me or something like that, by me. And again, we're going to say, well, that's just a passive marker, Wapnik, what are you talking about? Not necessarily. So here we have me marked with a, uh, me is technically an oblique here. It's marked with like a preposition or uh, something like that. But a true inverse marker just switches the rules. So you could say again, you hit me, but then you could still say you hit, you, you hit me. But instead, you'd impl you would add a little thing called an inverse marker to the verb, which tells you that the roles are switched. So this would really be, I hit you. And you're going to ask, well, how do these work together? And I questioned that for a long time until I read a grammar of Chukchi. So, I'm again, I'm... I, I'm it is a bit confusing, and I'm, I'm probably going to mess up while explaining this, so please, please do forgive me. So, Chukchi is quite an interesting language because it has both direct inverse and ergative alignment. So, how this works is that Chukchi will define a few pairs or a few... Uh, how do I say? Uh, Chukchi will find define certain pairs of commonly did a, uh, commonly done actions. So it'll have these basic distinctions. But what happens is when this uh, when these distinctions are uh, when uh, something is outside of these distinctions, just to clear up things, they'll use ergative case marking to fix this. Last thing I promise will be done with the goals very soon is vowel harmony. So vowel harmony is a little feature in languages where certain groups of vowels have to agree with each other and that they have to harmonize. So this can be divided along a lot of things, including a combination. So it can be divided by frontness, height, or, round, uh, or rounding harmony, which are commonly defined as like the three the three big distinctions of vowels, even though things can get a bit more complex than that. So front harmony, would there be like front vowels versus back vowels? So think something like e, e, think something like, okay, I'm going to use Turkish as an example here. In the front set, you have vowels like e, e, u, and e. But in the back set, those would contrast with a, o, u, and u. So you'd have something like a versus e. Or maybe, again, maybe this is uh, e versus u, or e versus uh, u. 
or maybe even like uh, the other one. U versus U, or uh, O versus E. So I'm thinking I want a, a frontness harmony system, but again, uh, a lot of things uh, get messed up by sound changes. So there's also ATR harmony. Let me give you an example of front harmony. Let's just make up the word uh, comma or something like that. Or kamu, kamu. Let's say this is a verb meaning like to eat. And then we wanted to make it past tense. Let's say a past, uh, past tense suffix was like ka. Then kamu ka. Assuming this is back harmony, everything is just dandy and works fine. But what if we have a front stem word like uh, tebi? Well, ka won't agree with that, so we have to change it to a ke. So then we'd have tebi ke or something like that. So I hope I explained that. So I just hope you have a basic idea of these concepts. So you kind of know what you're getting into and you kind of know what I'm going to be doing. So now without further ado, let's actually get into the conlanging or clonging as I like to say. Anyways, now that I've jibber jabbered about uh, goals for about quite a while, let's start with planning. So the one part that I do have to admit that I worked uh, on uh, a little before I started this uh, actual series uh, is the tense and aspect system because I have no clue why but for the longest time I struggled to get something I liked and I, I am just going to say this uh, it's not like I have everything done but it's just a basic kind of idea of what I want to do so anyways let's get into it so I don't you know for for like a for your standard polysynthetic language I don't want something that's uh, too complex like Navajo. I want something a bit more simple, like more along the lines of Chukchi. But again, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure entirely how, uh, how complex I want it to be. Just a little more complex than Chukchi, perhaps. But anyways, I, I'm thinking of, for an example, uh, I... I'm thinking of like an imperfective and perfective aspects, and these would merge with your your past tense, your non-past tense. So I would like a non-past and a past split. So you have past and non-past. Let me actually move that. And past. past and then uh, towards the end I would like intentional conditional uh, and then maybe like a, a potential conjugation to add some more depth because Finnish and Chukchi do something similar to this, where you have the tense aspects and then you have the moods along the side. And then I would also, I also would like a dubitative form, because I know uh, some of the Eskimo Alut languages have that. So, let me just move this to the side a little bit. Again, I'm, I'm just kind of spitballing at this point uh, before we look for validation behind these different tense aspects and moods. So let's just call this Tam quickly. Um, I was also thinking a separate, uh, how do I describe it? A separate inceptive or encodative mood would be good. And if for those who don't know what this means, it's like to start doing something, so I'm just going to put that under inceptive for now. And then I would also like a terminative or a cessative, and this means like I finished doing something or I stopped doing something. So let me just clone this quickly. I would also, I believe, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, and I'm sorry, but I believe some languages, I think 
Greek, Arabic, and uh, some uh, languages native to the Caucasus Mountains do this. But I would like uh, a split in both uh, dynamic verbs, which actually have a distinct uh, like the end point there. Uh, they actually take place in like a point in time versus stative verbs, which are more just indefinite states of being. So I'm kind of thinking of doing something along those lines. Now, the reason why I'm actually going to move these over here is I'm thinking here that in the proto-language, there would be some constructions with, so let's just say we have this verb here, and there'd be a construction with uh, a participle, or, sorry, participle, Participle, okay. Participle. Um, and then a copula, which is a word like to be. And I was thinking that either alternating the tense of the copula or by alternating the participle, we could get a few inflections here like a habitual or an experiential and a perfect. Something along those lines. So, actually, let me. Hmm. So, there are a few actually uh, interesting things. So, we in we we can choose in this conlang. So, most languages distinguish between the imperfective and perfective. And usually, you can get, uh, you either mark the imperfective or the perfective. And many languages uh, will do either one. So, let's just think. If we had a marked perfective, like, let's just say the perfective is marked by something like to finish or doesn't really matter what verb it comes from now, but we're just in a spitballing stage. Let's just say that comes from to finish, or something like that. Well, normally if you had a marked imperfective in the stative, it would become like an encoative, or like it is becoming something. But if we just had to finish here, having to finish in a state of inflection, would just kind of be like a past, and we already have that along here. And then the imperfective wouldn't really be like, give us anything interesting like an encoative. So that's one thing to note. And then the other thing to note is that, how do I describe it? If we have just to finish here, I mean, maybe in the non-past it would be something like, uh, a perfect. However, I, I, I don't fancy that too much. And if we did have a marked perfective, we could distinguish between a normal present and then like a progressive or more of an ongoing action. Maybe a continuous would be a better word for that. But yes, we'd have, we'd have that nifty little distinction. The other thing that leads me to say that is, again, I apologize, this is the one bit I've worked on to for. Let's say we have to be either pl uh, just here uh, with like a present participle or something like that. And then to be, I'm just going to say past here, with either a past participle or a past tense. So I'm thinking that I suppose this to be plus, plus a present participle, that's definitely going to give us some kind of an imperfective meaning like uh, it, it could be uh, something like, it, it could be as well like a present or a present continuous, but it could also be a habitual, which I think would work well. And again, if we had the finish here, if you're finishing like usually doing something, that might imply like I used to do something, which... Again, I, I, I don't really care about making that distinction too much. So, 
However, again, if we did have this imperfective marked, that would be like that. If we had the, sorry, excuse me. Um, we, if the imperfective was marked, we could just leave this as a default and make it a, just a normal habitual. Sorry if that's a bit confusing, but again, I hope you walk into the series knowing that this is going to be mainly me thinking out loud. Okay, now with the past participle, or just the past to be, that could be something like, well, I was thinking that a past participle, or just a past to be, plus some kind of participle, that would kind of form a perfect, because it's like, I am having done something, or in English it does sound weird because the copula, or the to be word, plus past participle, does kind of say like, I am done, or like, it does give a passive meaning, but it could also give a perfect meaning. So, again, assuming that the perfective is unmarked, in this, or if the perfective was marked, that would again give us something like a pluperfect, which again is not a s distinction that I'm... I don't want this to be too complex of a system. I want it to be a bit more minimalistic, but not too simple. So maybe we could even ditch the idea of a past entirely and just have the perfect, the perfective as a standard perfect. Then the imperfective, if we had a mark, so let's say this is marked, this would be a habitual. Because in English, that's, a, that's actually kind of how it works in English. Like you can say, I have eaten or something, but if you like put it in more of a imperfective meaning, you say, I have been eating or something like that, uh, that gives you more of a habitual meaning or uh, maybe even a usitative. So I might have to think about this a bit more, but yeah, we may not even need a past participle entirely. Okay, let's get back here. So, now that we have concluded that we do indeed want a marked imperfective, like from something, maybe like a verb, go ahead and mark perfective, maybe like a verb to stand or sit, those are very common, but again, it doesn't really matter now that we're just in the planning stage, or the very beginning of it at least. So, we have a marked imperfective. And, again, I think perfective in some cases is a bit misleading here, because it, it is going to be more of a perfective meaning, but to be fair, it is just going to be a bare stem. So, to help us know that, I'm just going to add that there. So, a bare stem in the non-past definitely just gives me a straight up present meaning, like, I am eating. So, let's just use our... For our example dynamic verb, I'll use to eat, and for our example stative verb, I'll use, okay, I'm just, like, maybe, maybe, to just, maybe, like, to be cold. Let's do that. So, if we have, uh, let me, let me actually move this all, like, a few down so I can organize a bit better. Okay, so yes, yeah, so definitely a marked non-past is going to give us an imperfect, it is a uh, marked non-past, uh, sorry, an unmarked non-past is just going to give us probably a present-like meaning. While if we marked the imperfective, like we are here, uh, it could, like, for an example, in English, the, uh, or this is kind of a shift that's going on right now, many people are just using the standard bare stem now as, like, a habitual, like, I eat is no longer, like, I am, or I'm currently eating, but it's becoming more, I just eat in general, so it's like a nomic or a stative, or it seems like it's becoming that, at least. While, if we had... Um, we had like an, uh, how do I describe, if we marked uh, the imperfective again, 
Uh, I'm so sorry, I'm being a bit scatterbrained. So anyways, the normal I eat in English is becoming like more of a habitual. However, the, the uh, normal, uh, the, how do I say it? The continuous or progressive is becoming the new present. So we could have done something like that. But I think I'm going to keep the bare stem as the present for now. And then mark the imperfected with a progressive or a continuous. Just something to emphasize that the, the action is incomplete. Okay, moving on. Uh, so if we just say, like, I ate, or that's just the bare stem in the past. That definitely just gives me a past perfective feeling. So it's just maybe even, it just happened. <laughs> so that's definitely a past perfective. Well, if we had stand, I would say I stood eating or I sat eating. So anyway, since we have the imperfective marked in the past, that definitely gives me a feel for a past imperfect. And again, um, for the purposes of this, I would like to leave it up to context what, what exact type of imperfective it is. I don't think we currently uh, really need to specify between usitative and uh, past usitative and all that kind of stuff. So then as we kind of figured out, I think our old to be or copula construction that got sucked onto the verb and the imperfective will form like some kind of habitual or gnomic. And then in the perfect, I think the perfect would fit well for this. My only complaint is that it is perhaps a bit weird to just have it to be just to be a perfect. And I, I, I'm not saying I don't think that's possible. Oops. Uh, I think that definitely is a possibility. But maybe, maybe it's not the best. So what if, again, we kind of go back to our original, our original little thing, where if we, let's just say it doesn't matter whether it's marked or not, just, let's just say for the bare stem, we get the habitual or nomic. But yes, I think a past, a past copula or a past participle would work well for more of a perfect encoding. So let me just actually just merge these little, these little cells. Merge. Oops. Let's fix that quickly. I apologize. Okay, that looks better. And then, uh, anyways, for our past, for to be, I think we should have, well, here's the thing. I would like a separate perfect and experiential, and I apologize if my terminology is wrong by any means, but what I mean here is a perfect is just saying like something like I have eaten or well, the whole point of uh, these to be constructions is to show that they have relevance to the uh, to the present. Like when you say I have eaten, you're focusing that it has some kind of result or effect. Otherwise, you could have just say I ate to say it's complete. Um, then an experiential is more like I have eaten. I have eaten hot dogs before. Or. I have been to France before. It would be something like, it would be that kind of sentence, or like the action has been done before. There was the experience that it happened. So, I mean, we could just have the bare stem of the past copy would be the perfect. And then maybe I, so for an example, let's just think. I stood having done something, or Standing having done something, especially if this copy love evolves from something like to live, I think that wouldn't be a bad experiential. I mean, I, I don't want this language to be like, <laughs> or how do I say this? 
I want, I, I know reduplication is a very natural thing in most languages, so the other possible thing is we uh, reduplicate the perfect to get the experiential, but again, I'm not entirely sure. But for now, uh, I'm liking the way this looks. I just realized I might need to add a future in here. In fact, I probably should. Anyways, moving on. Our inceptive, I... You know, I don't really feel a need to, like, distinguish between the different stems with this. So I'm just gonna straight up merge all of these. So, um... This is just gonna be a normal inceptive. This will be just a terminative or sessative. I'm not worrying too much of terminology. Okay, here. So, I, I see nothing wrong to combine these with, like, just the non-past and past tenses. But I feel like this is going to be another similar case to just what we did here. It's, it's mainly, I, I don't think we need to worry about aspect too much. I am going to allow the aspectual split, but I don't think there's, it's really necessary too much to list out all these forms because if we have the imperfective and past, like for the dubitative, I could say, I, like, I doubt he's eating. Or he, he is eating vegetables, because, I don't know, maybe this dude's, like, very picky, like me. Uh, so you could say, like, I doubt he is eating vegetables, versus, like, I doubt he ate vegetables, or something like that. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's wrong to do tensor aspectual splits. So I think this dynamic, I think this works well. And for the purposes of our little aspects, I mean... Maybe we should think a bit more to see how we could incorporate them, but to be honest, we might just even have like little auxiliaries or little particles that just straight up clitisize, glom onto, or just fuse to the verb quickly if people uh, don't entirely know what these are. Dubitative is like saying, I doubt, I doubt something happened. Potential is like saying, like, I may go to the store or I might go to the store. Conditionals like, I would have gone to the store. Can be something like that. Then intentional was, well, intentional. Okay. Now for the state of conjugation. And I think after we do this, I think we can say this was a very successful work session. Okay. State of. Non-past, I think we're just going to have a standard present state of in this case, like we did up here. However, for the imperfective, so uh, again, for our stative, you can just say, you, it, well at least not, in, at least in this way, you can say in English, I am being cold. That is bad grammar. That is bad grammar. Or, I am knowing English. Or I'm knowing how to speak English, or you you can't you can't say it like that. So in this case, if we had an imperfective, that emphasizes that the action is incomplete. And in this case, with uh, a state of verb, that would be incoative, like I am becoming cold. That would that would kind of be all, something along those lines. Or I I became cold. It, it shows or. I become cold. Anyways, I'm just emphasizing that the state isn't quite reached yet, or it's at least getting there. Well, now that I thought about it a little bit for a second, um, I just realized that we don't really need to have an intentional mood, and that we're also, again, I need, I need to add the future quickly, um, but we are forgetting a big thing, and that big thing is that we should also probably have an optative imperative mood or, or just an optative mood or a separate imperative mood. So let's just have it. Let's just add the optative. Oh, optative imperative. Or I'm just going to call it that for now. Okay. Anyways, for the perfective for the past, this is just going to be like a past stative. I suppose. I... I, I, I was about to make this the past incoitive. 
like it became cold and I mean that's fine this is quite like transparent though okay let's just, let's just move on so when it comes to it so with the terminative as in like it finished being cold my mind immediately just jumps to it is no longer cold or it stopped being cold so I think again we can just say well it's a terminative and then again, these are these are kind of givens. Um, I mean, maybe we could merge the encodives because I'm okay with just having one encodive. Yeah, let's let's do that. If you guys have any 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 thoughts on just keeping them separate or just merging them, please let me know. So, I would say that this is a pretty solid verb template for the time being. I'll probably make the chart a bit more neat and uh, I'll need to think about it a bit more, but depending on how I feel about our little intentional mood mode, whatever you want to call it, and whether we want to do just the norm, we want to make the copula, the past, or just have a past participle. This is actually looking quite good. We made some good progress. Well, everyone, if you did happen to come across this video, thank you very much. And if you did like this, I encourage you to subscribe and like for more content. But if you do have any comments you would like to make, I encourage you to dislike. I remember, I'm not encouraging you to write hate comments or anything, but I encourage you to give me some constructive criticism as, as this is my first video. Let me know what you like, let me know what you want me to change. So anyways, toodaloo!